Uh, it's exciting to see some <laughs> very familiar names in the audience. Uh, so uh, this is a collaboration with Abdul Latif, uh, who's in Heriot Watt, and Hokon Hoel, who used to be a W1 with our chair in Erwitiha, and now he's an associate professor at the University of Oslo. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, what is this about? Well, let's start with particle systems in the mean field. And uh, what do we want to say here? Well, interacting particle systems are a collection of coupled, usually identical and simple, models that can be used to model more complicated phenomena. We think, for example, of molecular dynamics, which each of the of the particles in that system has a, a position and a velocity, but is interacting with the, uh, the others around it. I mean, by some potential or something like that. Crowd flow simulation, well, that was by uh, Abdul Latif, uh, Max of Physics back in Kaos in 2010. Each of the people that are moving in a sort of um, specific uh, uh, situation inside of a crowd is described by a velocity, a position, and again, some equation that describes the evolution of the velocity, uh, in terms of some forces, and these forces are related to what this person wants to achieve in terms of what is the path it wants to, to go through or what is the, the exit door it wants to reach. And then other interacting forces, for example, that person doesn't want to be crushed against a wall or uh, doesn't want to be too close to, to other people because it could be trampled if it falls and uh, so forth, right? Um, Oscillators, that's uh, related to the examples that we're going to describe later. Um, well, examples in fluid, mean field games, neur neurons, uh, neurons in, in, uh, in, uh, in, bio, in biological environments and finance and economics as well. So these systems are extremely flexible to describe, like I said, complex phenomena. And what the mean field tries to capture somehow are emerging patterns, right? So we want to see some uh, essentially patterns of essentially here people moving around the Kaaba, right? And how much of a danger this could bring, if, for example, there's some kind of stampede or some pressure points, right? Where people could be trampled. And if you're trying to direct this flow of people for maximum safety, you would like maybe to even put some obstacles in this path to try to guide people uh, and to minimize these pressure points. All right, so certain stochastic particle systems have mean field limits, and we're going to specifically be talking about this thing today, when the number of particles increase. Essentially, the whole thing here is that when you have too many things around you, you start seeing the density of the things around you and not each of these uh, other interacting particles in, in particular. Such limits, therefore, can be useful to understand the complicated phenomena, because instead of, for example, looking at 1 million particles, you may trace some density that describes uh, their state in both position and, and, uh, and uh, velocity. For instance, in this example, Abdul Latif was, was, uh, was computing um, a crowd, right? That was trying to exit through this door, starting from a position that was just quiet in this square, for instance, maybe they were sitting here and then suddenly something happens and everybody tries to leave quickly through this, uh, this, uh, this door. In that case, well, each of the particles actually is described by its own position, but also it has a velocity. So here you see all the particles in the position plane and all the particles in the velocity plane. And this, this crowd is evolving towards going here. Okay, so this is time one, for example, 300 particles. If you go to time 2.5, this has moved closer to the door, right? And here the density is sort of showing you the highest concentration of pressure points, right? Um, all right, and here in the velocity plane, you don't see much. All right, so, um, so far, finite system of particles. Let's go now to Makim Vlasov, and let's see the connection between the two. Uh, Makim Vlasov uh, is a stochastic process described by a neato stochastic differential equation in our context, whose coefficients depend on the distribution of the solution itself. This is key, right? This is what separates the the Ito, the classical Ito stochastic differential equation or system of uh, stochastic differential equation with Makin Vlasov. They relate to the Vlasov uh, model of plasma, uh, and it was first studied by Henry McKean in 1966. Now, let us for a moment introduce some notation. Let's denote mu, the probability, the marginal probability uh, distribution for x of t at time t, and we say then that the process X, right, in L2 sense, 
this uh, is follow, uh, follows this stochastic differential equation. And observe again what is key here is to see that the drift, for instance, does not depend just on xt, but the law of xt at time t, which is mu t. And the same happens with the diffusion. Okay, at, 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 a, at, a, at an initial time, right? I mean, you, you, you have this mu zero given and you solve this for t larger than, than zero, of course. But immediately when you see this equation, you see, okay, this is not, not the standard thing that, that you, will, uh, you will expect, right? I mean, in, uh, in this context of stochastic differential equations, if I have, sorry, if I have a, a stochastic differential equation, I will be given an initial condition, right? And given the W, I will be able to simulate and uh, as, as I want essentially the, the path that is generated here. But here, in this equation, things are more complex, right? Why? Well, again, we have this mu here inside. And even though mu may be given to you at the initial condition, and you could be able to take one single step with Euler, for example, if you're given x0 here and, uh, and uh, the mu0, or, or equivalently, its density, rho0, well, you will only be able to take one step with Euler, right? And immediately then you will say, okay, Where's my new updated uh, law at time zero plus delta t? That is nowhere to be found, right? I mean, I'm tracking only one single, one single trajectory. Immediately, therefore, you realize, okay, I need more to try to approximate this equation. I need to somehow track the, the particle, or essentially the, the trajectory I'm, I'm seeking, right? Driven by my dw here, and some way to reconstruct my density. And, okay. For what what purpose? Well, uh, in the in the purpose of of this talk, I mean, I I will be concentrated later on 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 weak approximation, and therefore, I will be looking at at real value quantities like this, expected value of a given observable g evaluated at the final x t, right? And of course, uh, you see here that immediately again the law enters here, right? Because I mean, I'm integrating g against the law of of x at final time. Um, let's see an example because maybe the first equation was too abstract. Um, here, I immediately have a particular case of this dependence with respect to the law. I say, well, the evolution of X is given by you know, the value of X, but also with the expected value of X. And immediately you say, okay, but I have only a single trajectory. How could I do this? The same, the same here in, 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 in the diffusion. We need to do something about this, these coefficients, right? I mean, we need to be something to do something to evolve somehow this density as I evolve also my particular trajectory. Well, a typical approach involves stochastic particle systems. In which sense? Well, we say fine, we don't have this this uh, this expectation, but for instance, I could ap approximate this by some sample average with respect to some number of particles, and I will. I mean, I will describe what particles are just immediately, but essentially they are solutions of the same equation, but with initial uh, initial conditions that run uh, are uh, are sampled out of mu zero. So in this case, you, you will have something like this, right? To be capital here, and then each of these xp's, right, evaluated at time t. Of course, this will not give you the exact equation, and one has to say, fine. Even if you do this, this uh, sample initial condition and you evolve together all these p particles, right, following this equation, and you approximate this expectation by the sample average, what is the guarantee that things are going to go to the right thing, right? And 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 please observe that once I couple the, the I mean, once we couple the, the equations in this way, these uh, these xp particles are no longer independent, right? Because they are driven, uh, I mean, this, this is approximation of the expectation is, is driving all of them. So they get immediately coupled and the system is not trivial. So in that case, you have a sample average, but I mean, the things that are there are not independent, right? So it, it is also a non-trivial question to see actually the thing go, things go to the right way, I mean, to the right limit and an even more refined question with which speed. And when you consider speed, you would say, okay, in which sense? In L2, LP, weekly? All right. So uh, let's see. When we talk about, about uh, systems then of, um, of particles with finitely many particles, we say, 
as I was describing before, consider now uh, a particular case where the law is actually entering through this, uh, this uh, convolution, right? So essentially each of the particles or each of the, the, the I mean, in the, in the McKean blast of equation that we are particularizing with here, evolves with a drift that is coupled, right? That depends on the law and simply here, some, some diffusion that, that is not coupled, just for to simplify the things. In that case, for the McKean Vlasov, right, you may have this, this equation, and here you have the law, right? And and the notation infinity here will, will be clear now when I describe the, the finite system. Uh, here we have each of these particles, each of them has the same law, right? Because the, the equations are the same, the, the, the Brownian motions could be just independent, but by construction, these things have uh, for different values of p, the same law, and they're independent as long as the w here is independent. Because remember, the law here is a deterministic object, right? So there's no, there's nothing more. Now, if you go to a particle system, say of finite size p, what, what we think essentially that will be the counterpart of, of, of this McCain blast of here will be something that instead of having the integral with respect to the correct law here, infinity, has this approximation a la Monte Carlo, right? But again, please, things are not independent, so this, this is not exactly Monte Carlo. Um, and and uh, now we have a finite system that is evolving with P, P capital uh, coupled the uh, stochastic differential equations. And at the, at the final time, we can approximate um, this, this expectation, right? By taking, because each of them still has the same law by construction, right? Uh, an average over the p particles and possibly averages over the realizations of running the several times the system of size p, p, p right? Of course, just to be consistent, if we say that uh, that our initial law was uh, at time zero given by this, each of these particles should be identically distributed and independently sampled out of this initial uh, law. Okay, so. This is somehow the connection that we are going to follow, right? I mean, you have the original system that is driven by, by a, a density that we do not know, right? And we are going to approximate it by a system of size P, and P is related to the number of coupled equations that we call particles, just to, to, to have some name on this. And uh, we are going to try to see what happens as P gets large, right? It's key that we have this averaging effect. And of course, we need to have some regularity on A as well to be a capital as well to be able to, to achieve this approximation between these two things. All right, um, fine. So a couple of observations more here. Um, what is the, the evolution of the marginal distribution? Well, think of the following case where actually the, the measure, uh, the marginal measure at, at time t has a density and we call again, this row infinity, um, this row infinity will solve a nonlinear Fokker Planck. Why? Because, well, if you look at this equation, um, and if you think that mu is a given object, right? You know from, from the theory of stochastic differential equations that the, the marginal density of X will follow um, a Fokker Planck with this drift and this diffusion. The point is that actually the marginal density on, also enters here. And this will give us the, the nonlinear, the nonlinear coupling, right? And when you, you know, when you write this nonlinear Fokker Planck, well, you see the, the standard terms. I mean, in this case, I'm just putting the, the previous equation where the coupling is only in the drift, just for simplicity. And immediately you get in 1D, you get this, which is the classical th term. This will be the classical term as well. But now you have this nonlinear interaction between these two things, right? And then finally, this linear term because there was no coupling in the, in the diffusion. So you could actually, for the main field approximation and even for the computation of this expected value of G, if possible, solve this nonlinear PD. This is totally okay, right? I mean, you have to solve a nonlinear PD and as long as your, your PD solver sustains the, the, the dimension of, of, uh, of the state X, you can do that and it's, it's, a, it's a good method to follow. Um, but today I'm going to be discussing 
uh, a Monte Carlo type of, uh, of approach, right? Following the particle system. So what are the questions that, that, uh, that one would like to, to address? Essentially, like I told you, what happens when the size of the of the of the coupled system, right, of called the interacting particle systems of size p, goes to infinity? Do we have a limit? What is it, the, the the strong rate of convergence, for example, in LP in probability? And what about the weak rate of rate of convergence, right? So, given a sufficiently smooth observable here, we compare the expected value of of uh, some some particle uh, at a system of size p and some, some particle at a system of size infinity. And of course, when we go through the things, we will see that uh, this is going to be one over P, right, given enough regularity. All right, so uh, here another example before I jump on the, on the thing. Uh, this is Kuramoto, the celebrated Kuramoto, Kuramoto example. Here's the reference in 84. Uh, the drift, the drift is coupled precisely like like in this A that I was talking about. Now you have a sinus here, and it's more than just a dependence on on two variables. It's the, dif the, the dependence on the difference, right? And this term is trying to pull the particles together. Um, so uh, in this case, essentially, what one is trying to see is whether the system goes into total chaos or there's some kind of synchronization. And the total order um, quantity that one, one tries to compute an expectation of is given by this thing. When it gets close to one, you're close to order. And when it gets to, to zero, you're, you're unsynchronized. Um, all right, so let's see. One can, um, like I said, one can, one can try to play with this P and let P go to infinity and understand what happens when, uh, when this, uh, this uh, this limit occurs right from the computational point of view. There are interesting things that are happening. We take more and more averages here. The the variance of of this quantity actually behaves like one over p. So this gives some kind of advantage when you're trying to use the Monte Carlo method, and uh, so forth. So you can also introduce discretizations right when you simulate as we do with the with the standard ACEs. You can play with multi level. You can play with multi index, and uh, you get farther improvements, but that is, I mean, that thing is not the talk of today. So for that, I give you some, some references from, from, from us, right? Where we did some multi-level multi-index for, for the McKin Vlasov, and then we, we did some important sampling for that uh, in hierarchical fashion as well. Um, and I also cite the two, I mean, the two master thesis that, that the group did one in 2010. It's incredible how time flies by Abdo and, uh, and by Sham in 2020, maybe I, I think I made, no, maybe I made a mistake on this 2020. Anyways, let's go to the talk of today. Um, so this take, this talk is based on the, on the collaboration with Abdo and uh, Hokon. Uh, it's, a, it's a preprint. And uh, our goal was to develop proofs of existence, uniqueness, strong and weak approximation, propagation of chaos for and uh, we wanted to do it in such a way that we would use tools familiar to master students and PhDs uh, just essentially using the calculus and the standard things that we'll teach in a, in a course for numerics on ACEs. Um, why did we do that? Of course for didactical purposes but also because we wanted to um, to keep adding the, the supporting theory for the methods that we derived um, and uh, in, in the context of approximation for, for Makin Vlasov. Um, I, we do know that there's a vast uh, literature in the subject, and I'm not going to be able to cover the things. I put some pointers here for those that are interested, and uh, let's go directly to the thing. So let's consider now our class of Makin Vlasov. It's not the most general Makin Vlasov that you can think of. Uh, it has coupling in both the drift and the diffusion, I'm going to present the results in a one-dimensional setting. So I save some indices and you will understand when I start playing with indices that why this thing actually is going to be beneficial for the presentation. But in terms of generality, this can be uh, generalized with much, much of an issue. So um, we have coefficients. These coefficients are going to, to satisfy some regularity conditions that I'm going to state. And we consider this, follow, this uh, McKean-Blasov equation. Right? We have mu s, 
to be the marginal distribution of, of uh, Z at time S. And well, we have an initial condition that is given with the, with the law mu zero. That is exactly what, what happens here. So um, how do we start? Well, we say that to, to obtain strong approximations of, of this Z that we seek, we're going to use um, a system with the D particles. I, I changed the notation, sorry. I changed from D to from P to, to D. This is not the dimension, it's just the, the size of the of the system. I mean, we're working in dimension one. So if somebody is confused, please stop me and ask. This is a, a friendly environment. Let's see, do I see something in the chat? Okay. So um all right, so let's see. Um, we have the, the, the system here of the D particles, right? And we have the coupling term. And this is a, um, a full system with size D, fully coupled because of the, of the interactions on A and sigma. Um, okay, so if you, if, you, uh, if you look at this coupled system, what is driving it, are of course the initial conditions that are given by the xi i's and the Wiener processes wi that in this context are independent and still one dimensional, as I told you, right? The z's are one dimensional. Um, I must emphasize again that by construction, these particles or these components of the system are not independent, but because of just the standard, the standard symmetry on these equations are identically distributed. Of course, the distribution depends on the size of the system. That is important as well. And hopefully, uh, as D goes to infinity, the only thing that will matter for each of these x's in terms of the, the, their paths is their initial condition psi and their, their corresponding um, driving Wiener uh, wi. Okay, so let's go to the strong analysis. First observation for any t as, a, as by construction essentially, these x, uh, xid components are exchangeable, meaning that if I compute the expected value of a given function that depends on the whole system, right, I will just permute with any indices, uh, any, any, with any index permutation here, and I should get the same expectation, right? Just again by construction of the of the system. The assumption that I was mentioning to you before is just the Lipschitz regularity of the drift, right? The sigma and these kernels that appear in the coupling. Let's see again the equation, right? Uh, the kernels were appearing in the coupling here. K1, kappa one, kappa two, A and B and sigma appear in the in the in the diffusion, and, and the, these should be Lipschitz functions, and these should be Lipschitz functions as well. Here, we are not going to discuss, uh, I mean, we're not going to track the different possible constants that these things can have, and we only bound everything by a given C. Um, we make some assumption on the growth, so we don't assume them bounded, but we have some control on the, on the, on the growth by this bound. All right, so here comes the thing. Uh, what we use in the analysis are conditional expectations. And uh, this is one of the things that simplify the, the, the approach. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to make it uh, as explicit as possible here. Let fi of t be the sigma algebra generated by this pair, right? The initial condition of the, the particle i and the, the Wiener process that drives it up to time t, right? So this fi is given by these things. And we define now a conditional expectation. So the condition expectation said uh, di of t is the condition expectation of this particle, observe the same index here, given all the information that happened until uh, fi. So essentially, I'm, aver I'm averaging with respect to all the information provided by all the other initial conditions and all the other driving Wiener processes. All right? So, what do we what do we, what do we observe now? Given the the independence of the driving in the processes and the corresponding condition expectation processes, said I, are independent now and have the same law by exchangeability. So, 
these guys here were the components of a coupled system of size D. Each of them have the same law, right, by exchangeability, but they were not independent, correct? They were not independent, they were coupled. Once we do this projection, once we do this conditional expectation, what we get is an object that now is independent from all the others for different eyes and still has the same law. This simplifies the, 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 the approach as we will see. Because essentially, if you want to see convergence, for example, and what is our candidate, what, what is our candidate for, for convergence here, it's essentially uh, this guy. This guy is the one that is going to converge. And now the good thing is that even though I'm, I'm raising the, the, the dimension of the number of particles and I'm introducing more and more noise and things are going to get complex, this guy is always going to be related to a probability space that is connected to, to WI and Xi. -I. And to characterize conversions there will be much easier because it's just a fixed phase. It doesn't depend on the size D. So let's see. Strong analysis. These things are, are kind of standard, and, uh, and I'm going to try to, to go through them, um, making the emphasis on how the conditional expectations appear and the role they play. But, but it's not that this is new or anything like that, right? I mean, I'm not, I'm not claiming that this is new. I'm just revisiting from a slightly different perspective. That's it. All right. So uh, first of all, you get the boundedness of, of the moments for uh, NEP of the particles provided that you have the right, the right uh, integrability on the initial condition. Uh, then you have sort of a Cauchy type of uh, estimate, right? I mean, you have sizes, uh, systems of size D, systems of sizes 2D, and you, you, you look at the particles driven by the same noise WI, well, they are getting close in, L, in L2P with this rate, right? Right, so that is not surprising also. Um, and now you go to the conditional expectations. I hear Jens's inequalities is something useful because I mean, if you if you have some some uh, approximability in some components, then you project them. You're going to still keep this approximability in the in the conditional expectations. So what you get immediately is that these guys that are going to be again the candidates for convergence are getting closer and closer, and uh, they are drive uh, they are driven by by the same the same noise. Um, so that that is really good. Not only that, uh, you can actually bound moments of increments of these these guys, and uh, the constants are not going to depend on on the size of the of uh, of the of the system D, and this will will allow us to use the Kolmogorov chance of uh, theorem, and then from here we get that this Z i are almost surely pathwise gamma Hölder conditions in in T with this gamma that connects again to the integrability of, of the initial condition, right? So if in the best possible case, right, you get again a regularity that is the, the regularity that you will get out of a, of a stochastic differential equation, right? The same as, as, the, as the Wiener path. Okay, so, so far things are going in the right direction, nothing strange, nothing surprising, just this insistence of mine to track conditional expectations and not the particles themselves. Um, okay, so what about the, the convergence now? Well, as I said, now we can, because of the, of the fact that you are working with the conditional expectations, we can, we can uh, work uh, um, assuming that we have this integrability of the initial condition. We can work here on, the, on this fixed space and uh, uh, we get, um, let's see, this is not the convergence. Okay, let's see the sequence and converges. Yeah, okay, yes. This thing, this subsequence, right, converges in, in L infinity to, to, to the FTI adapted process C infinity. So we have convergence. We do not know yet whether this guy is going to solve the, the Makin Vlasov, but we have some kind of convergence. And we have also the regularity of the limit because it is inherited directly from this Kolmogor of chance of. Uh, estimate before. So now that we have these guys, we're going to use uh, them to, to prove existence, uniqueness, and strong solutions uh, verification to the, to the Akin Vlasov. 
What are the tools? Well, like I told you, Jensen inequality to pass these uh, inequalities that we have on X to Z, right? And then some will hold the Levis Gund inequalities. Um, and of course, I told you the common word of chance of to, to get regularity. Uh, I must say again that the strong estimates are standard. We just make this emphasis on the on the conditional expectations. So, what are the type of estimates that these set eyes uh, follow? Well, they are close to the to the axis, and that is not surprising because this thing removes all the noise that is not the one driving the the particle i explicitly, meaning the initial condition and and the the W, the W, I. But we know, I mean, that if, if things are converging, the, the X's shouldn't, shouldn't uh, depend much on noise that are not, not the ones driving uh, the particle I either. So somehow these things have to be close. Okay, and this only confirms that, that fact. Okay, so, but that was more like a, an observation. But now, now comes the thing. The mckinn vlasov equation, the strong solution and verification. So. We need this regularity now. The fourth moment should be bounded. Now we give an initial condition xii and the Wiener process uh, wi. We again uh, discuss this uh, zi. We have this limit zi uh, uh, that it existed, right? Zi infinity that existed as, as uh, d goes to infinity. But now we can verify that this guy is a strong solution of the mckinn vlasov equation that it effectively satisfies this equation. And also, one can one can show uniqueness for for the equation as well. Um, yeah, and that is uh, is uh, is something that that uh, comes very very simple based on the on the um, on these projections on these conditional expectations because they are independent and you can play several games. Um, like I said, well, you get existence and uniqueness and we get this L infinity LP uh, approximation of ZI and uh, XDI. All right, so what else do I want to say here? Um, let's go to the weak analysis. Oh, yeah, one last thing. Even if there is no noise and the randomness only comes from the initial condition, and then we have random ODEs and not just the stochastic differential equations, um, the analysis can be carried out. You get you get the the, the result as well uh, as well with the existence of uniqueness, and then of course if you do the the Cornwall chance of you get regularity that that is up to essentially one with the regularity we have here. Of course, with more and more structure, one can prove uh, more things. But uh, this is useful. What I wanted to say is that this is useful even in the case where you don't have the the driving DW noise. Okay, so what about the rate we convert convergence? Yeah. Is this going to help in some way? Well, introduce some notation that is classical. Let's see, uh, multi-indices for derivatives, right? Makes a derivatives. Let's do like this, right? This is the usual uh, notation. And we're going to use this for the L1 norm of the index L, meaning the sum of all the components. And now we work with the condition function, uh, some continuous functions, right? And the corresponding L infinity norm. And uh, well, when we say that we have a, a, a norm of this type, right? I mean, a semi-norm of this type, we sum over the indices from one to K uh, of these corresponding um, norms here. So what else? Yeah, okay. So what is the, conver the, the weak convergence result? And this is the one that I'm going to, to spend a couple of minutes explaining the, the proof. Let's consider a particle system, right? With the particles. And uh, this is the strong solution of, of the coupled system two, right? This is the, the, size, the size D system. And let's say with the components as well, be identically distributed independent processes solving the McKinn-Vlasov, right? Driven by each of them by the by the the, um, the same noise that is driven uh, the, that is uh, driving um, XDI. Okay, so this is the shadow system that I was putting at the beginning. Let me go back just to put it in front of you for a second, and then here. Okay, so we have these guys that are. It, that are coupled, of course, but each of them 
is driven by by this wp right and these guys that are driven by the same term here so you expect these guys to be close but instead of having this if you wish sample average kernel you have the integral with respect to the correct marginal density right so this is the difference between the two and we have changed the notation because you know i'm using the the set notation too okay so let's go back Okay, so we we'll work here. We have XD components of the of the coupled system dri uh, driven by W1, W2, W3 up to WD, with initial conditions Xi1, Xi2 up to Xi D. And these guys that are the uncoupled ones, driven by the same noises, but they're uncoupled because they all connect to the exact marginal density and they don't see you know each other. So they are by construction IID. So what do we say here? We say that if you consider now a function g that depends on the whole xd uh, evaluated at final time and you subtract this from from the same function g but now evaluated at the solution of Makin Vlasov copied d times using the same noises as I use for for this xd well this difference is going to be bounded by d to the minus one and db in the size of the system that I'm using here times this uh, the sum of derivatives of of, uh, of g right up to order three why is this so well let's see this is essentially based on the on the tale and two arrows and trick to represent this weak error as a as a difference between cost to go functions evaluated at final time and initial time then use the eto formula and from there everything follows there will be a, a small technical step in between and uh, I'm going to make the, the, a comment on that. Okay, so error representation, talent to our trick. First of all, we look at a, a generator for the system, the, the system of size D that is coupled and the system that we call the infinity size, but still with D components that is uncoupled because it's integrated against the, the exact um, mu T uh, law. So for the first, essentially we said that uh, the the drift and the diffusion have the same type of coupling, right? Each of them have the coupling through this average of the uh, of the uh, kernels over the particles, right? One is for the drift, and you get a derivative of the cost to go, uh, and then for the second one, you get immediately the second derivative. In this case, though, when you have the 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 system with infinite size, right? Each of the particles doesn't see the other particles, but the, the 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 law so this xi is going to be integrated again this mute variable set and the given law here and of course you get the same derivatives here the same derivatives there so once we we understand that we can go to the next step which is the error representation per se and we say first we introduce the cost to go auxiliary function what is it? Well, we say that we introduce uh, the unique solution of the Kolmogorov backward PDE, right? Um, that has this generator, the generator of the decoupled particles. Final condition is G, the observable that we wanted to compute an expectation of. And uh, just by, by the standard Kolmogorov uh, backward uh, uh, result, we can represent the solution of this linear PDE, linear parabolic PDE, as an expected value. An expected value of what? Well, a conditional expectation of G evaluated at final time on the system of V particles, having started each of these particles at a position Xi and Xi being the components of this, uh, this, uh, this bold phase vector here, X. And now we say, okay, what would be the difference, the error difference, which is the weak error between G evaluated at the solution of the of the coupled D size particle system minus G evaluated at the solution of this uncoupled system, right? Uh, of said components. Well, by by construction, you know, this this guy here corresponds to this, and just starting the the 
the components at final time at the position Z, right? Uh, and this, I mean, I'm using this, this definition, right? U, U, T is just U uh, at, uh, at, final, at, at time T and Z T. So you start with the initial condition Z, Z T here, and you let the, the, the system evolve um, along, along the trajectories of X, the conditional trajectories of X, having started at the position Z, right? And then this is the, the value of U. Right, so so pictorially, uh, I always like to make this kind of uh, picture. You have t here, t, t little t. You have some initial condition here, and then you go like that, and then you're going to integrate with respect to the corresponding density here, the function g, and that is your your uh, your uh, your cost of all, right? So, but based again on this on this uh, definition here uh, of this capital U in terms of the little u that satisfies this equation, you can write. And this is the representation, the, the trick of Talian Tuvaro. Right? Um, you can write this error as the difference of the same function u between time t and time zero along the paths of uh, set. So uh, once you do that, well, of course, you use ito here, the martingale the martingal term, uh, term disappears, you only get the drift. And in the drift, you get exactly, uh, <laughs> exactly the, the L infinity the, the L infinity guy plus the derivative with respect to time of u. But this exactly is minus this other term because of the equation 14. So once you substitute that, you get the difference of the two generators applied to the function u. And the function u uh, is the one that satisfies this equation. So, all very compelling, but not yet the result. Why? Because, okay, we have just rewritten the, the error in this way. We need to here understand what is this difference. And this difference will bring um, also the derivatives of u, right? Because the derivatives of u are connected to these generators and the generators have uh, up to derivatives, uh, up to second derivatives. Because of the fact that we need to track the, the differences, we are going to introduce the effect of the third derivative. And that's why the result actually has the third derivative here. Okay, so first of all, how does this guy look like? I mean, how does this guy look like? Apply to the to the U. Well, we have the difference of the drift and uh, the difference of, of the of the diffusions. But the good thing is that this is a common factor in each of those terms. And that is that is essentially good news. In the in the in this part, we have a difference between again. The set i's right applied to this uh, this integral with respect to the mu, and here the same set i's but now uh, summed over this uh, you know this approximation of this integral based based on the particles essentially that's what what happens here, and if you want to estimate it well, you can estimate it and and based on the regularity that it was assumed for for the function a and for the the kernel k kappa one, you end up getting here something that has d to the minus one. But now you need to have some control on the derivatives of u, right? So you get derivatives of first order here, derivatives of second order, and immediately this brings you to this norm. And instead of the order three, from here you get order two. But for the next term that has this, 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 uh, this second derivative to start with, you do the same type of computations and you get a three here. So once you once you have this type of thing, you say, okay, I can control this integrand that was here by one over d and uh, derivatives derivatives of u. And what do I know about u? Well, what I know is that u by construction satisfies this PD, and the final datum is g. So, provided the right regularity on the coefficients of this PD. I, one, one, what we did was to connect the derivatives of u and control them in terms of the derivatives of g. And uh, that's what, what happens here, but this is the technical detail that I was talking about, because here one needs to introduce a variation. So one needs to show essentially that these derivatives provided the regularity, these derivatives of u are bounded by the derivatives of g, right? So some kind of maximum principle up to a constant here. Um, so you have the, the, 
the derivatives of u, you essentially go into the, the, the expectation, right? That was the representation of the u. I'll say, fine, if I have the right regularity in g, I can get inside here, take a derivative with respect to x, commute the derivative with the, the expectation and have a derivative here. And now I have to, to use a chain rule on, on x at final time and take the variation of x at final time with respect to x at time, say, little t, right? So now I have this object, which is the, vari the first variation of uh, the trajectory of x at final time with respect to the previous value at time t. Mm -hmm. I need to control that thing. And this is essentially what happens here, right? I mean, when we take this, uh, this uh, chain rule, this guy appears, and this is what pops up that needs to be controlled. So from here, one can take L infinity, no problem, right? And here, one gets a sum of expectations of absolute values of these first variation components. So putting everything out, essentially, you get what you want, but you need to control this guy now. And this is the technical part, right? I mean, one has to, to, to work a little bit here to, to get a control of, of, uh, of this term. And this term is actually the kappa that crucially does not depend on D. Crucially does not depend on D. And this is very important because otherwise we wouldn't have the result. Similar type of estimates follow. If you have, for example, second derivative here, then you have to, to get the second derivatives here and, and uh, still you get uh, other variations as well, because I mean, now you have to take more derivatives here and you don't track just the first variation, but you take the second and so forth. But uh, same techniques apply and you get the result. So all in all, what do we have? Well, after that, you get this estimate, which is not yet in the form that one would like to have, right? I mean, usually, one is computing an observable of, say, the first component of the system, right? Because one is not computing an observable with, with all the d particles and d is going to infinity at the same time. Uh, this is just a, a, an auxiliary result, but, but the main thing that one would like to use it to, for example, are averages. So um, from the previous theorem, if you just depend on k components and k is finite, right? D is going to infinity, remember? k is finite. Well, you can use it and essentially um, get uh, a convergence rate one over d because k is now fixed. You get this combinatorial coefficient because of the of the exchangeability here, and here you get uh, derivatives of g, and this is again finite because k is mm. finite. So you get finite number here, finite number there, and one over d. Of course, the theorem could could even apply when mm. this k depends on d on a weak on a weak way, right? I mean, for example the uh, k is connected to, to some kind of weak power of d, for example, one d to the one over four, you could still get some rate of convergence here. Things are going to be slowly blowing up here, but, but all in all, you're going to still get some convergence rate with respect to d. It's not going to be one over d, it's going to be something less. And okay, let's make the, the, the comment on the most classical example here. One will be here uh, working with g, which is directly an average over, say, the d components of some g tilde. If you apply the theorem, essentially, when you when you want to to compute this uh, this uh, approx approximation error, well, you again write write it in terms of this g that involves all the components, and then you get immediately the, the rate one over d, but connected to the the original observable, right? Um, and the regularity is again up to three derivatives, the one you need. Finally, I want to, to make a, a comment on, uh, on the gap that exists in the, at least in, a, in, in our current theory. I mean, maybe you know, and you can point me to, to, to results. Um, now we consider some case that it's outside the regularity assumptions, right? I mean, we have some, some not so super nice kernels here. And we use Euler Maruyama just to, to try to understand what is the rate of convergence. And uh, well, okay, we have some, some histogram of values and everything, but the rate that we get in terms of the weak approximation is still one over D. And that we cannot explain with the current theory. So it would be nice to, to, um, to be able to relax this, uh, this sort of leeches, the type of, if I, if, if, yeah. 
type of regularity that 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 we assume to get the results. Um, and um, I think that brings me to the end of the of the presentation with a gap. So many more things to do, and we don't have a way to to deal with this. So maybe you know, and you can tell me. Thank you very much. <laughs>